So first of all, just to give you a little bit of context where I'm coming from, uh, I work for a firm called Cambridge Systematics. It's a national transportation consulting firm. Um, we work in a variety of disciplines, economics, asset management, travel demand forecasting, operations, goods movement, um, greenhouse gas mitigation, and of course, uh, climate risk and resiliency, uh, which is a much broader practice, risk and resiliency, not just to, um, to natural phenomena, but to, man and, uh, to, to human induced uh, hazards as well. Um, so the sort of thread that runs through all of uh, my organization's activities is transportation. Uh, and we work primarily uh, with surface transportation modes. Uh, and when I say that, I mean uh, mostly highways, transit, rail, uh, and we touch tangentially on issues of uh, air transport, uh, maritime transport, for example. Um, so just so you know my bias, I work primarily with government clients and I work primarily on surface modes. Uh, so there's a much broader world out there and I'm just gonna give you a little piece of it. So I thought that uh, one of the most useful things to do, and I think particularly since uh, most of you folks haven't covered transportation in depth, uh, is just to give you sort of an institutional lay of the land. Who are the key players uh, and what sorts of activities have they embarked on to uh, introduce the concept of climate change resilience into uh, transportation activities? Uh, so probably first and foremost on the national scene, of course, we have the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation, of course, is headed by the Secretary of Transportation, which is a cabinet level uh, position. U.S. DOT, however, is, is, has a fairly small staff, uh, and most of its duties are delegated out to what they call the modal agencies. So these are Federal Highway Administration being the very biggest, Federal Transit Administration, FAA, everybody knows Federal Aviation Administration, um, although there's also Federal Motor Carrier Safety uh, Agency, there is uh, Federal Rail Administration. So there's a whole host of agencies that deal with various modes, uh, MARAD as well for, um, for maritime modes. So just to, and I'm gonna talk primarily about FHWA's activities because FHWA is a major client of mine. I'll also say that FHWA is here in force. Um, tomorrow afternoon, the first session right after lunch, I'm actually going to be uh, presenting a workshop on our Tri-State Post-Sandy Transportation Resilience Project with FHWA and with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers so you can learn more about uh, FHWA's activities. They're also participating in the, the Tools Cafe down there later. Um, the Transportation Research Board uh, is, uh, just like it sounds like, it is the research entity. It's an arm of the uh, National Academy of Sciences uh, and that's really where uh, state DOTs, the federal government, um, consultants, academics, uh, really the entire transportation community get together and they establish a national research agenda for transportation. The Transportation Research Board, or TRB, uses a committee structure. Um, so, and I think a lot of the National Academy's branches do. Uh, so committees really drive the research agenda. Uh, committees are typically centered around a topic sometimes a very broad topic. So for example, I'm a member of the Transportation and Sustainability Committee. There's the infrastructure, Critical Infrastructure Protection Committee. Uh, and for really emerging sort of seminal topics that need to be explored in a cross-disciplinary way, cross-disciplinary within transportation, of course, uh, we have the special task force um, structure as well. Uh, there is a special task force, for example, on climate change and energy. I actually uh, missed our quarterly call uh, because it coincided with this meeting. <laughs> so don't ask me what's going on with that right now, but that is a great resource within TRB to understand because uh, its mission is really to gather um, a whole host of committees together to talk about the issues of climate resilience, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation, and uh, energy within transportation. Uh, one of the principal products or programs from uh, TRB is the cooperative research programs. Uh, the largest is the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. There's also a, a Transit Cooperative Research Program and uh, an Aviation Cooperative Research Program that are significantly smaller, but these programs are really intended to sort of push the national uh, transportation research agenda. And literally millions and millions of dollars funnel through these programs every year, which are carried out primarily by academics and consultants. So though, although uh, each, um, each sort of inquiry or each topic uh, within the research programs are usually headed by a panel, multidisciplinary panel uh, of primarily federal uh, and state government uh, transportation employees. There's also the American Association of Highway and Transportation Officials, or AASHTO. Uh, this, that's quite a, a mouthful of a, an acronym there, but uh, an AASHTO is really the venue uh, through which 
um, state departments of transportation, and I'll talk about their role in just a second, um, get together, uh, coordinate. Uh, they also have a lot, of res uh, a lot of influence on the TRB research agenda as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about them too much, just to say that they um, also function through a committee structure. Um, the committee, the Ashto committee that would really matter on this topic is the Standing Committee on the Environment, or SCOE. Uh, and those committees are populated solely by um, officials from, usually fairly um, senior officials, from state departments of transportation. And then we have a host of federal partners that work um, primarily with USDOT and FHWA on the topic of climate change adaptation and resiliency. Uh, and I've listed only, I've listed some real alphabet soup here for you, but uh, this is a very, very partial listing. I realized today, this morning as I was going over this, that I had neglected to put FEMA there, obviously a big one, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, but we also have the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Weather Service, um, a key uh, provider of climate change uh, data, projections and data to the, to the community. Uh, we have NASA, of course. Uh, we, uh, the previous presenters, uh, or in the previous session, folks talked a lot about topographic information and digital elevation models. NASA and actually uh, the United States Geographic Survey or Geological Survey um, provide a lot of that information uh, to the transportation community and for a lot of other uh, related applications. EPA, Bureau of Land Management, I'm not even going to start to, to try to, uh, th that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of federal agencies um, that partner with transportation agencies, whether at the federal, state, regional, or even local levels, uh, to tackle the issue of climate change. So to step into sort of the implementing bodies, the subnational bodies, and I should say that Federal Highway Administration, um, they are sort of thought leaders or practice leaders. Um, they are funders. Uh, they are they serve a regulatory function or maybe more properly a rulemaking function, but they wouldn't describe themselves as implementers. Implementation really falls to the state, regional, and local levels. Uh, so these are the implementers, uh, chief among them State Departments of Transportation. This is uh, a good deal of my client base. Um, state Departments of Transportation are constituted differently in every state of the union, although every state has one. Um, some of them function almost like USDOT, uh, like sort of mini models of USDOT. Uh, they have division offices, they have modal administrations. Um, some of them are, are pretty sort of uh, meat and potatoes, focusing mostly on highway uh, construction and administration. Um, but that's sort of your first line of defense and, and one of the major implementing agencies in the transportation ecosystem. Um, State Departments of Transportation manage typically what we call higher functional classification facilities. So these are your interstates, these are your arterial streets, um, some of your major collectors. Um, they leave typically county roads and city roads, or what we call local streets in the sort of scheme of functional classification, uh, to counties and cities. It's very difficult to talk about their role in a systematic way because it's different from state to state, from region to region, um, from city to city. Uh, just know that they're part of the equation uh, and usually an important part of that equation. Um, who here has heard of a metropolitan planning organization? Just out of, all right, so not bad, uh, maybe 40% of the room or so. Um, metropolitan planning organizations are also a key part of the sort of transportation ecosystem. Um, and I don't think that they have a great deal of awareness among the general public. Um, so they're often sort of struggling to assert their relevance and uh, talk to the general public about what it is that they do. Very basically, they're all charged with coming up with a long range strategic plan for their region. Um, basically a broad vision for the future of the transportation system more broadly uh, for an urbanized region. Some of these are very small because to qualify as an MPO, you only have to have an urbanized region of 50,000 people. Uh, or more, so it's a very low bar. Um, so some agencies will basically just do some planning. Uh, they'll prioritize investments uh, through a, a fiscally constrained program called the Transportation Improvement Program, or the TIP. Um, but for some of them, it, the TIP is just the tip of the iceberg because they have a broader range of programs, they have a lot of capacity, and they typically serve as sort of regional conveners to talk about big uh, strategic planning issues and, and envisioning issues for the future. And I should say when metropolitan planning organizations are working on their long range transportation plans right now, they're thinking ahead 25 years. They're looking at the transportation networks, the sort of future of transportation multimodally and their region in 2040. So it's a chance to step back from the implementation function, which is really um, housed within the state DOTs and with the counties and cities and say, 
all right, we're doing all this work. We have all these construction programs, all of these management programs, uh, asset management, maintenance, operations. But what do we want our region to look like and how should transportation support that vision uh, in the future? Um, and just as an aside, I know this is on the record, but it's been my uh, experience that MPOs uh, often are much more progressive than the state DOTs in uh, sort of in, in whose jurisdiction they function. Uh, so if you might imagine, so I've done a lot of work in red states. Uh, I've done a lot of work in Arizona and Texas and Tennessee um, on climate change issues specifically. That surprises a lot of people, but I actually typically work for the MPO region. Uh, and I think just by virtue of being in an urbanized region, uh, by being separated a little bit from the, the, the constant press to implement projects, um, they tend to have a little more space to think uh, about, as I said, about the future uh, and climate change being a huge part of the equation when we think about the future of our transportation networks. And then there's the private sector, and the private sector is all over transportation. I'm not going to talk about them a whole lot, but obviously we have our airlines, our, um, our railroads, particularly our freight railroads, our logistics providers, uh, we have um, concessionaires, we call them. So uh, they, they come up with uh, public-private partnership agreements, for example. Um, so they're part of the equation, too, even though I'm not going to talk about them a whole lot. Um, so what I figured, I, I, you know, rather than try to um, talk about the scope of activities across all of these transportation entities, I thought I'd talk a little bit about Federal Highway Administration's programs because I think Federal Highway Administration has really been a thought leader in this area, and I've worked a whole lot with them. They've worked with many of the um, MPOs and state DOTs who are here in attendance today uh, on climate change adaptation issues. So uh, Federal Highway Administration's sort of overarching goal is to really, in a systematic way, integrate consideration of climate change into planning and decision-making processes. As you might imagine, transportation agencies, state DOTs, and MPOs um, they already have um, decision-making processes to deal with a broader range of challenges in a very fiscally constrained environment. So Federal Highway Administration's goal is to basically um, make sure that, that um, climate change is considered as, uh, in, in the same light and in, through the same processes as any one of a number of transportation challenges that these entities already have processes to address, like congestion mitigation, for example, safety issues, um, the list, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation, the list goes on and on. So FHWA really has a two, oh, and I'm, I'm getting the hook here, so I'm going to have to speed through. By the way, folks get these slides, I assume, yes. after the fact? Okay, good. Um, so I put in a whole lot of, a whole bunch of project examples that I'm not going to get to. Um, I guess we can ask, uh, you can ask me certainly during Q&A about them. Uh, but you'll also have these slides and you have my contact information if you have any questions about them. FHWA has a two-prong program that I'm not going to get into too much here today, but um, there's a systems level program, so it's looking at basically planning on a network level, and these are issues of strategic long-range transportation planning and asset management, which is really about making um, cost-effective, high-performing investments. Uh, and then they're looking at these issues at a project level as well, so how are facilities designed, constructed, procured, and ultimately maintained and operated. Uh, so at a systems level, the sort of key product is, or the key program, I should say, is the climate change adaptation pilots. Um, if you get one takeaway from this entire presentation, it's that the adaptation pilots, uh, rounds one and two, have basically pushed money uh, along with sort of a framework, a, a sort of a general conceptual process for addressing issues of climate change. Uh, once again, within the scope of standard uh, planning and decision-making processes. And they've pushed money out to um, a total of now 24 regions um, to really help them think through these issues, experiment, innovate, um, identify challenges, and then help Federal Highway Administration incorporate that into presumably a rulemaking eventually that will require agencies and be prescriptive about how agencies address issues of climate change and their processes. And then there are a whole bunch of uh, Federal Highway Administration uh, sort of directly sponsored and managed programs, uh, including, as we mentioned earlier, that this uh, Sandy, Trans uh, Sandy Transportation um, Resilience Project. And I encourage you to um, go to our session tomorrow if you're, more inter if you're interested in that activity. And so there's the framework. It actually comes with about 50 pages of guidance. Um, but it's fairly, it's, for Federal Highway Administration, you'll have to trust me on this, it's not particularly prescriptive. 
Um, it's very much a concept and a template for agencies to follow. And then there are a whole host of um, uh, sort of what they call project level activities. This is looking, really applying principles of engineering to projects to look at how, does, how to design uh, facilities to be more resilient, um, to reduce exposure, to reduce the sensitivity of those facilities to extreme weather effects and how to enhance um, the adaptive capacity of those facilities. Um, there are multiple projects ongoing right now. There, there may actually be um, 30 or 40 um, sort of separate uh, engineering-based adaptation projects ongoing right now. Federal Highway Administration once again has sort of pushed this out um, through several parallel efforts to try to um, have, to basically to try to work with partners at the state and local levels uh, to help them innovate and honest uh, and, and uh, in the end have this great information percolate up to the federal level so it can be more broadly disseminated. And I'm going to skip through all of my project specific slides here. I do have a World Bank slide in there just to say that obviously the international community is dealing with these issues as well, um, primarily through the development banks, which although they're not transportation entities, they all have transport and infrastructure divisions, uh, and they've been, um, they've been real innovators in this space as well. Unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of what I'd call cross-pollinization between uh, the domestic sector and the international sector, but uh, uh, we're getting there. Um, so what's next? I think um, expanding the scope of these inquiries and assessments. Um, typically, we're just looking at single modes. Uh, we might look at aviation by itself. We might look at highway by itself. Um, sort of the next frontier, I think, is looking multimodally and looking at a network level. Um, Cross-sectoral, uh, you've heard all day, presentations from folks in other sectors. Um, there typically hasn't been a whole lot of overlap uh, between the work that we do in transportation, the work that colleges do, or the work that uh, folks in land use do. Um, that needs to change clearly because there's not, transportation does not exist just by virtue of needing roadways. We need to connect uh, critical origins and destinations. Uh, we need to um, serve populations. We need to um, serve critical activities. Um, so it needs to become uh, more multi-sectoral. Uh, we also need better ways to, I think, characterize the ramifications of climate change uh, on transportation uh, and on uh, dependent systems. So uh, transportation performance measurement is a very robust discipline within the National Academies of Science, um, but it hasn't been applied very effectively, in my opinion, to transportation resiliency assessments so far. So we need to bring financial performance measures, economic performance measures, uh, measures of mobility and accessibility into the mix as well, because that's really how we prove to executive level decision makers within departments of transportation um, how much we really need these programs. Um, agencies need better ways to manage uncertainty. And once again, that's also a very important um, aspect of bringing executive level staff to the table. Um, if you just say, we know things are gonna get worse, but we don't know by how much, it's very difficult for someone who's responsible for allocating um, well, increasingly um, flat or diminishing budgets to a very ambitious uh, program of transportation needs. Um, so helping to manage that issue of fundamental uncertainty uh, is gonna be very important for the, for the transportation industry, but basically anyone you've heard from today. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, uh, mainstreaming, which basically means integrating this information into the existing plans, processes, procedures that transportation agencies have already established to manage their challenges um, is going to be of critical importance. So I'm hoping that I will stand up here in 10 years and not be um, the leader of a risk and resilience practice, but just somebody who works on risk and resilience issues within a much um, broader generalized uh, planning and decision making framework. So I think I ran over my time, but I really appreciate it. Okay.